I'll be taking you through our journey, our future roadmap, and lessons learned while optimizing our Docker builds for speed. My name is Nicole Rifkin. I'm a senior software engineer at Simply Business, and we're a subsidiary of Travelers Insurance. Our core product is an online marketplace selling small and micro business insurance. Think about your local barbers, landscapers, or bakeries, typically businesses with 10 employees or fewer. At Simply Business, we have a few service-based applications, but today I'm going to be talking primarily about our monolithic Ruby on Rails application because it supports the majority of our core product. We have about 150 engineers who each ship code continuously, and we also have a fairly standard deployment pipeline that supports this. We use Docker to build our application image and then push it to AWS's Elastic Container Registry. Then we use Amazon's Elastic Container Service to run anywhere between one and several instances of our app, depending on load. The whole deployment process from Docker build to receiving live production traffic takes a little bit over an hour. In this talk, I'm going to be focusing on that first Docker build stage and the optimizations that we've tried to implement. We first Dockerized our application a couple of years ago, and at the time, as performance-minded engineers and good stewards of our CI and CD pipeline, right away, we adopted some of the recommendations for best practices so that we could get the best performance out of Docker. To take advantage of Docker's built-in layer caching, we arranged and rearranged the order of execution in our Docker file to maximize cache hits. At the end, we were pretty happy that the result was about as optimal as we thought we could get it. When the feature came out, we took our optimizations one step farther and we adopted multi-stage builds. Here's where things get fun and definitely a little more complicated. Each box in this diagram represents a different build stage in our multi-stage Docker build. At the top, we start with our custom base image. It's basically just an Amazon Linux 2 distribution and it has Ruby pre-installed on it. We separately also use the image currently running on production which is the previously built image, and we use that as a cache, but I'll talk more about that in a moment. As a first step, we use Bundler, which is Ruby's dependency manager, to install our dependencies. And this is going to be a Docker layer cache hit as long as no dependencies have changed in a given deploy. The next step is to copy over the rest of the application code, uh, and we're fairly, we can be fairly confident that for most deploys, there will be some change to the application code, so this will not be a Docker layer cache hit. Now, there are a couple of next steps that we've broken out into their own stages so that they can run in parallel. The first stage pre-compiles and minifies client-side assets. This is a standard and built-in Rails optimization, and there's no custom code here. The second stage runs some internal business logic that generates our static insurance documents. These are PDFs that get sent out with every policy that we sell. Now, before either of these stages execute, we copy both the insurance documents and the pre-compiled assets over from the previously built image that we're using as a cache, even though these aren't going to be layer cache hits because they come after we've copied over our code. Each of these stages go pretty fast unless either the assets have changed or the standard documents have been updated as part of a particular deploy. Finally, as a last step, we're going to copy everything, secrets, pre-compiled assets, custom generated insurance documents onto our final release image. This keeps the final image that's actually running on production as thin as possible. Phew, there is a lot going on here. So thank you for sticking with me through this explanation. So what's the problem? We now have a reasonably complex Docker file and our Docker build is still slow. Builds most frequently take about 18 minutes, but depending on the number of cache hits for any given deploy, it can take as few as 12 or as many as 35 minutes to do a build. On top of that, our optimized and supposedly thin built image is actually huge. It comes in at four gigabytes. At this size, we can actually see noticeable time costs just in upload and download speeds. And those are costs that we don't incur at build time. We incur those later in the deployment pipeline. So why do we still care about this? We've put a lot of work and time and energy already into optimizing our build process, and it's still not nearly as fast as we would like it to be. So why not just suck it up and deal with slow build times? And there are a couple of reasons why we still think this is really important. 
If you've read the book Accelerate, and if you haven't read it, I really recommend it. I'm certain that this book will come up in other talks today as well. Anyway, we know from the research in this book that there are four key metrics that the most productive and successful companies all do really well. One of those characteristics is how frequently an engineer is able to deploy their code with more productive tech companies doing more deploys more frequently. A second characteristic is how much lead time there is from a feature request coming in to that feature going live to production. A slow deployment process is necessarily going to throttle both of those, and our deployment process has been getting dramatically slower over time. More importantly, we want developers to be able to deploy all of the code that they write and take responsibility for debugging when things go wrong. You build it, you run it, you break it, you fix it are our simple rules. And as software professionals, we all know that our attention spans are just not all that long. <laughs> Expecting anyone to babysit an automated process for over an hour is fairly unrealistic. And all the time we see developers with the best intentions who start to deploy and get distracted or pulled into a meeting, or they break for lunch or sign off for the evening and deployment failures go unnoticed. We really do believe that reducing the time it takes to deploy could basically solve this problem entirely. So because we still believe that this is important and worth the effort, our quest to optimize our Docker builds continues on. The next optimization we tried was migrating over to BuildKit, which is Docker's new build framework. One of the primary motivators for moving to BuildKit from the traditional builder was being able to take advantage of their inline caching feature. So with this feature, it caches image layers for remote base images. And we thought that this could create some real performance wins, especially when we talk about using our previously built image as a cache. This is a huge image and it, because it's our production image, it will have changed on every Docker pull. It will have changed on every deploy. So having access to a layer cache could really reduce the time it takes to pull down that image. We briefly enabled inline caching after we had migrated over to BuildKit, but found that it actually doubled the size of our release image from four to eight gigabytes. We still ran a couple of test builds to see if we got any performance improvements by using the inline cache, but because there's such a wide range in our expected build times, we couldn't actually see or measure any observable improvement. So what's next? We could continue to make changes and hope that those changes made things faster, but it was getting really hard to tell if we were making our performance problems better or worse. We wanted to collect more data, so we started by building out a system that would let us automatically track build and deployment speeds over time. This is really helpful for doing some A-B testing on our optimizations because before we started collecting this data, we had no way to confidently evaluate if a change was successful at all. But the solution still has a few drawbacks. It requires a lot of analytics to do an A-B test like this, and as an ops team, that's not really our strength or our area of expertise. This also might result in us temporarily slowing down the build in order to collect enough data to test out our changes. And that's really frustrating to be making optimizations and only have things go slower. The data we were collecting every time a build started, succeeded or failed, only helped us understand the changes we were making retroactively, but it doesn't help us identify future areas of improvement or give us direction on how to optimize. And finally, it doesn't paint a complete picture of where exactly our changes are helping or hurting. What I mean by that, for example, we've talked on uh, we've talked about how some of our existing optimizations involve copying data over from a previously built image that we're using as a cache. We don't know how long it takes to copy over that data, although we know that it can be a non-trivial amount of time. And we also don't know how much time we can actually save by introducing a cache. It's very possible that for some of these stages, it would be faster just to generate everything from scratch than it is to copy data over from a different image. So we started searching for tools that would allow us to collect more granular data and clear up some of these uncertainties. And fortunately, Pretty early in our search, we learned that BuildKit has some really snazzy features for collecting open telemetry metrics for Docker builds. This BuildKit feature is integrated with Jaeger, which is a distributed trace visualization tool. It was originally open sourced by Uber. <laughs> 
The only downside of this feature, which was effectively exactly what we were looking for, is that it's relatively new. And as far as we could tell, at the time that we were implementing this, there were approximately four lines of documentation about how to use this integration across the entire internet. And as you might imagine, the setup process was not quite as straightforward as those four lines of documentation may have led you to believe. But we eventually did get it working locally. This build kit feature requires using build CTL, which is a build kit command line tool that only runs on Linux distributions. If you're developing on a Mac like I am, one hack is to use Docker and Docker as an easy way to fake a Linux virtual machine. I've written a blog post about how we got this working in case you're interested in implementing this for your own build systems. The blog post contains much more detailed setup instructions compared to the public documentation that was available at the time. I won't go into too much more detail in this talk, but I hope that you'll find it's easy to follow. So now, we, now that we have successfully configured this build kit feature, we had open trace metrics appearing in Jaeger locally. And for the first time ever, we were able to see detailed insights about the speed of our Docker builds. This was super exciting. We learned a couple of key things right away. For example, installing our dependencies took a full six minutes. Remember, out of a 22 minute on average build, this was way longer than any of us had anticipated. However, when it came to some of the other stages, because of the variability and the many layers of caching we were using, we wanted to collect metrics from a set of builds over time to get more useful insight about all of the stages so that we could understand how often we were seeing cache hits, how long a stage took with or without access to the cache. And for this larger task of collecting build metrics over time, there were definitely a few drawbacks to using Jaeger. Because it's an open source tool, the primary option seems to be to self-host, which obviously is a decent bit of overhead. And at Simply Business, we are already using New Relic and Datadog and Kibana and Airbrake for logging, error monitoring, and application performance metrics. Supporting yet another performance visualization tool was not our idea of ideal. But this build kit feature is tightly coupled to Jaeger. We did an investigation into using the Open Telemetry Collector. This is an open source vendor agnostic solution uh, that would solve our problem by acting as a proxy. So it can intercept UDP messages that are formatted for Jaeger and convert them to TC me TCP messages on any given port. In this case, we picked the Datadog agent default port because we wanted to view our traces in Datadog. We got this working, but this also required a decent chunk of overhead. To productionize this, we would need to have the collector running as a sidecar deployed alongside our Jenkins agent containers. Remember that all of this sidecar infrastructure wasn't even to support our application. This was to support our application builder. This was a lot of overhead and it was awkward. We spent days scouring the internet because we thought there had to be a simpler solution or that somebody must have solved this problem already. And unfortunately, there was not a lot of information or resources that we could find at the time. And finally, by accident, I discovered an undocumented feature of build CTL that I would like to evangelize to all of you here today. If you provide a trace flag and include a file path as a parameter when building your Docker image using build CTL, build kit will write all of the open trace logs to whatever file you've provided. This was exactly the simple solution that we needed. We now have a build observability pipeline that is super straightforward. It is simple, it is flexible, and it has very little overhead. We support running our builds via build kit using build CTL, the command line interface. We save the log output automatically to a file, and then we push that file to an S3 bucket. Each line of the files that we're persisting has JSON formatted information that corresponds to the different steps of the build. And now that we have some data to play with, we wrote some tooling to help us make good use of it. The first thing we built was a tool to compare two or more builds at every step to see where gains and losses were happening. In this example output, the red text is a step where build A ran faster, and the green text is a step where build B was faster. We can also compare execution time side by side for each step and each stage, and we can also display the deltas for every stage if we want to. 
This is really great when implementing a new optimization to compare it to the previous iteration. A developer can build their Docker image, save the log output, make an optimization, build their Docker image a second time, and then do a side-by-side -side comparison at an extremely granular level. We also can now do cool things like fetch and parse a week's worth of historical data and then filter it down to look at only a single build stage. This allows us to look at things like average speed and answer questions like how often we're seeing cache hits for any particular step in our Docker file. This is really helpful, not only for evaluating our changes, but for providing us direction and helping us identify possible future optimizations by picking out the places that are either the slowest or have the most variation. One of the drawbacks to the pipeline that we've implemented is that we don't support any indexing of the data by build step, so we can't really aggregate historical data over a long time period. However, we already have data on end-to-end -end build times, build starts, build completion, and build failures, and we can query this uh, to get a macro view over long periods of time. So now comes the fun part. For every change we hope to make to our Docker file, we can now answer questions like, how much time does this step add or remove from the build? How much memory does it add or remove from the final built image? What are the best and worst case caching scenarios and how often do we expect to see each of them? And now that we have this new tooling, there's all kinds of optimizations that we're currently exploring. We learned very early on the first time we were able to view our open traces in Jaeger that our dependency install takes about six minutes. And we know that we can reduce this substantially by copying dependencies over from the current production image that we are using as a cache. We're also investigating using Bootsnap as an optimization. Bootsnap is a tool open sourced by Shopify to reduce boot time in Rails apps with caching. Bootsnap is necessarily going to add some amount of time to our build stage, but it's also going to save us time later in our deployment pipeline at application boot. We can now quantify exactly how much time this is going to add to our build compared to how much time we expect to save. As part of this uh, data investigation, we also found that we spend up to 40 seconds loading the Rails framework to run some of our custom pre-compile tax tasks. If we implemented lazy loading of the Rails framework, in the case that we get a cache hit for our pre-compiled assets or for our custom insurance documents, this would bring that load time down from 40 seconds to milliseconds. And finally, we are planning to revisit BuildKit inline caching. This was the optimization that sent us down this entire observability rabbit hole in the first place. And we now have a lot more information to be able to evaluate if Build, the build kit inline cache actually is the right tool for our current system or not. There are a few learnings that I hope you'll take away from this talk and a few mistakes that I think we'd do differently if we were starting again from scratch. I think one key misstep was optimizing too early before we had data on our build process. Prematurely optimizing means that we now have an extremely complex build with six stages and more than 50 steps. There are still very few people at the company who are able to read the code and follow along with what's happening logically. And there are even fewer who understand the internals enough to confidently suggest changes. I personally wish we had focused on optimizing the slowest steps in our specific builds rather than implementing generalized best practices. I think the end result would have been much better for cognitive simplicity. It might already be building faster, and it would have made it much easier to make further optimizations in the future. And the last thing I hope you'll take away is that if you know where to look and you learn from our many detours and many mistakes, instrumenting observability in Docker builds can be really simple and is definitely worth the effort. That's all I have for today. Thank you all so much for joining for this talk. I will be hanging out in the conference chat to answer any questions until the next session starts. And you can always find me directly by reaching out at Nicole Rifkin in the Docker community Slack.